walked this road every year when it wasn't considered the proper and politic thing to do, when they took abuse for doing it, the people who told us we would never get anything, to see another generation of people, I see young people here, so glad to see so many young female faces here. There is one thing that is certain, is that Bloody Sunday will never be forgotten. And that the lessons learned from Bloody Sunday will never be forgotten. was founded by uh, Irish workers and uh, we think it's important to be, come here uh, and commemorate and stand beside the people of Derry. There's about 19 of us over from their region. The establishment don't want anyone to commemorate here. They, they, they don't want the march to happen. It's important to come over to remember that there was an atrocity carried out. There was 14 civilians murdered by the British Army on the instructions of a British state. And although there's been an apology issued, no one's actually been brought to justice for those killings. Um, we had the prospect of two soldiers actually getting um, the court for it, but that was then kiboshed by the British state. But now they've got a bill coming through that will wipe out any prospect, not only of people in Derry, but those in Valley Murphy and all over the British Empire, where massacres were carried out by similar people. If you look at the policing bill that they're bringing in Britain, people in Britain aren't aware of just how ferocious the British state can be when it feels threatened. And if they can massacre 14 people here and shoot a score more who thankfully survived, they can do it on the streets of London if they feel threatened there. The families have never ever given up their fight for justice and until there's been some prosecutions for the 14 murders that took place in these streets 50 years ago, I don't think we can ever let that go. We have to keep fighting, not just for the respect for the people that were murdered, but for the families and for the people of Derry. My brother was shot dead on Bloody Sunday, Willie, 19 at a barricade, along with two other young men. You know, at the same barricade, and my father ran out you know, because he spotted them, you know, lying there. And he ran out, he couldn't be held back, and I hate the bullets, I have to say. Um, they helped him. And the army came up, and they. Um, well, he was shot twice, and, and they come up then, and they dragged the body away and threw it on the Saracen, and along with the other two young men. So my father was in the hospital, remembered nothing, just remembered what happened at the barricade. And my mother was in the hospital too, she had taken a heart attack a couple of days beforehand, you know, so it, it impacted the family death, but you know, important. for all these years, you know, it, it sort of takes, takes over your life too. But you know what? Will they be there until then? They're talking about an amnesty recently. So that's what I'm focusing on at the moment, to get that absolutely stopped. That's a disgrace to even sort of suggest that. You know, to have murderers, to have anybody's security forces above the law. We have to walk in the footsteps of those who went before us in 72 to shoulder the memory of innocent lives cruelly taken, to reimagine the fear, the panic, the horror as events unfolded. And how much harder is it to be here today, 50 years on, 50 years of injustice? This was the day when the change of British government policy, which had started months before, came to fruition on these streets. Internment had been introduced to try and break the people. They had responded with more marches 
and a rent and rate strike. Nowhere in the six counties was that strike organised better than in that county. And nowhere in the six counties did the people pay more dearly for that mass action. Farmers' cattle, their livelihood, stolen from them and sold in auctions against their will for years after to pay for rent and rates. And there were some people in that county still paying for their rent and their rates when the hunger strike started, but still wouldn't give in and pay it voluntarily. And it was that kind of mass action that the British government were afraid of. They were afraid of the marches that came as a result of internment. Sometimes I only be angry with myself. I should have seen it. I should have seen it. Should have seen it after Bally Murphy. Should have seen it after McGillian. Should have seen it in the Dungannon to go light on March the day before Bloody Sunday. I didn't see it. Somewhere we still didn't believe they would do it, but they would. What happened on Bloody Sunday was a dairy event. It's defined the dairy over the subsequent years. But it's not just a dairy event. Bloody Sunday represents a history of Irish politics and Irish struggle down through the years. And the massacres and the atrocities visited upon Irish people who stood up for themselves. Actually, when you look at Bloody Sunday and begin to study it, this was an issue for America, for Asia, you know, for the whole of Europe. This was the period of the Vietnam War, the period in which anti-war demonstrators Civil rights demonstrators were shot dead in the United States, not just here. But the students of Kent State University were shot down for protesting against the bombing of Cambodia by Richard Nixon. Eleven days after the Ohio murders, two students at the University of Mississippi were also shot down. The demonstration which was asking for solidarity with the Black Panthers they fired 61 rounds in 28 seconds against maybe 150 young people. In the same period, Jan Pallets burned himself to death in Wenceslas Square at the centre of Prague after the Red Army of the Soviet Union marched in and crushed the Prague Spring. While we fight for the truth and for justice in relation to Bloody Sunday, we are fighting also for those who are denied justice. Bloody Sunday was the microcosm of what was happening then and still happens often today. We shall overcome. We shall overcome. We shall overcome. There are policy imperatives which other and um, turn groups into suspect communities because of their political orientation or their, or their, uh, their resistance to the state. The British state, using the Prevention of Terrorism Act in the 1970s, singling out the Irish community, the experiences of Muslims in Britain under Prevent. Kenneth Newman was brought to England by Margaret Thatcher. After the uprisings in Brixton and other cities, he brought with him techniques that he'd learned and developed here. And this is what he said. In the Jamaicans, you have a people who are constitutionally disorderly. It's simply in their makeup, they're constitutionally disposed to being anti authority. It was a style of policing that was about enabling the colonialists to identify and target those who might resist. Describe mining communities and liken them to Galtier Murray of the Falklands. And then she went on to crush the mining communities 
in Britain where striking violence and supporters were brutalised, arrested, set up on trumped charges. As a result of that we have campaigns like the All Grief, Truth and Justice campaign still fighting now for justice. At the Battle of All Grief, it was South Yorkshire Police and it was the same police force in 1989 that went on to disregard the shouts of fans saying people are dying and being crushed to death. And had the police been dealt with appropriately after all grief, there might not have been a Hillsborough disaster. Every time we have the temerity to stand up and rise up, we have another iteration. You all remember Martha, didn't you? They murdered that young man. It led to a demonstration that then led to an uprising that then spread across the whole entire country. There was four reviews, including the Metropolitan Police's own review, which categorically denied that gangsters had organised these uprisings. Theresa May gave Boris Johnson additional powers as the Mayor of London to deal with the gangs. They created a database, the Gangs Matrix, which contained 2,800 names on it. 45% of the young people who was on there had never committed a violent offence in their lives. They've done this database, they've shared this information with job centres, with councils, with schools and, and benefit offices. And all of these people withdraw services from these young people. Beginning in May 2020, my sister Claire and McCool experienced firsthand the new tactics the PSNA were adopting to punish those they deemed suspect. Access to your bank account was frozen ordered by an outside source. She had an 18 month year old son and was 6 months pregnant with another child. This bank account was her only means of getting access to her benefits. 13 days before she was due to give birth, she was told she would no longer be able to bank with Santander. The PSNA has carried out numerous house raids on family homes of those they deem suspect. In August 2020, the PSNA carried out one such raid on my home. My brother, who was 14 years old at the time, and who has autism, was physically picked off the ground and body slammed by a member of the PSNA. The officer then knelt on his back and another officer held his neck as they pinned him on the floor. They handcuffed him and removed him from the property. Eventually, he was de-arrested outside our local police barracks, literally left at the side of the road after being physically attacked. Eight days after this event, my family received a letter from Social Services Gateway Team saying they had received a referral regarding my brother from the PSNA. Without fail, social services write to these families as they wrote to my own and explain there is no need for their involvement. A culture has been created that there's a bunch of scrounging, no good fuckers out there and that they're living off of your back and that they need to be not only a suspect community, they need to be policed out of existence. So that's the culture in the welfare system, the right to work, right to welfare group, campaign for a human rights checklist. And that campaign has secured the support of every political party, every trade union, but hasn't moved the civil service. So there's about 15 of us, wheelchairs, walking sticks, women and children and all sorts of, and we're going to the Department for Communities to speak to the Permanent Secretary. The 15 people have done a reverse assessment of him. One of the questions was, Leo, how did you get here today? <laughs> he asked me, he asked me why, how I got here today. I, I, was, drove, I was driven, you know, uh, and, and people are going, yeah, because we get asked that all the time. And, and then, and, and the next, but the next one was something in relation to the rights. And then, Nick, on down the lane, it was, and uh, tells us, Leo, can you stand on one leg? <laughs> I love the kids. <laughs> no, there was one leg. Which is a question that was put to a woman who was sitting in the wheelchair facing them the days before when her benefits were stopped. And all of those people around that table on that day, days later, hundreds of pounds and thousands of pounds were in bank accounts. And that had nothing to do with them being right. It had nothing to do with them having proof. It had nothing to do with them telling the truth. It had to do with the fact that they took on and flipped power a bit, just a bit. The 1963 report of the Commission of Itineracy. The then junior minister, Charles J. Hawley, said infamously, there can be no final solution to the problem of itineracy until they are absorbed into the general community. Travellers are presented as a problem for which a final solution needs to be found. And this has been the thrust of uh, 
26 county state policy towards travellers since you can't pull your trailer or caravan over onto the side of the road anymore. You get locked up for doing it. It's now 60-70% of travellers living in standard accommodation against their will. At the moment, there's a bill going through Parliament. It's called the Police Crime Sentencing and Courts Bill. Legislation is a target of a certain groups, protesters, rovers and travellers. They're going to curtail their rights. They're going to be criminalising young people, further marginalising already marginalised communities, denying us the rights to protest about the above. And most importantly, they're going to discriminate against people that look like me and sound like me. We'll walk hand in hand. We'll walk hand in hand. We'll walk hand in hand. Someday. The hopes and the aspirations of those who took the route we taken 50 years ago are alive and are still being campaigned for. Because they organised against internment and for civil rights, against dire housing and massive inequalities. And in Ireland, North and South, we have a severe housing crisis. Our health services are in crisis. The climate crisis is hurtling the planet to oblivion. That's the message of today. It's the fights for civil rights are local, national and international. If I don't see the British government in the Hague, my children, my grandchildren, my great-grandchildren will see them in it someday. Yeah. Yeah. Deal the politicians and officers who did this. Deal a lot of them. But start, start. I would nearly give up everybody else if I could see Michael Jackson marched off to spend the rest of his misbegotten days behind bars in a prison cell. That's what we've got to do for Sunday. Let's keep going until we see them. Thanks very much.